History considers Julius Caesar as one of the most charming, inspiring, and successful military generals that ever lived. But while the annals are filled with Caesar's achievements and conquests, it is a shame that the men who made these feats possible hardly get acknowledged. So today on Nutty History, we are going to talk about the lives of the formidable and near-invincible legionnaires of Julius Caesar, who built the mighty Roman Empire on their shoulders. When Julius Caesar was selected as governor of Cisalpine Gaul, he was provided with three legions, the 7th, 8th, and the 9th. Seeking to launch a military campaign to extend Rome's rule over the rest of mainland Europe, Caesar then used the relatively new power of forming a new legion, the 10th Legion Equestris. A legion was among the two primary divisions of the Roman army, with the other being the auxiliaries. The difference between the two divisions was that the legions were recruited among only Roman citizens and were considered as an elite force. Records show that Julius Caesar never trusted auxiliaries like he trusted his legions. This also strengthened his bond with his legionnaires. Before the social war that lasted from 91 BC to 87 BC, legions recruitment was exclusive to citizens of Rome city only. But thanks to military reforms enforced by Gaius Marius, the predecessor of Julius Caesar, the doors of Roman citizenship were open for all Italians. Auxiliaries, on the other hand, majorly constituted Spaniards, Numidians, Cretans, and other Roman allies who were paid a third of the legionnaire's salary. Due to this reform, now legionnaires were loyal to the governors who handpicked them instead of whoever was sitting at the top of the Roman government. This helped Julius Caesar to cultivate loyalty among his troops unlike any other general did before him. He raised the 10th Legion Equestris from the ground and handpicked every officer and many soldiers by himself. If legions were the elite forces, Caesar's 10th Legion were the elite among elites, the special op forces. A Roman soldier enlisted or was called to duty in the army for about 16 years, which then could be extended up to 25 years. This is longer than life imprisonment in the USA, which on average could be 15 years. A recruit became legion at the age of 17 and was supposed to serve till his early 40s. Every recruit had to be fighting fit and anybody too weak or too short was rejected. Five foot nine, I didn't know they stacked shit that high. The least passable height was about 168 centimeters. Caesar's army recruits came from all social classes, unlike before when the Roman army employed candidates from the top five social classes. Their daily routine looked quite similar to a modern army base. A legion was made up of roughly 5,000 soldiers, and every legion was further divided into groups of 80 to 100 men, called sentries, led by an officer called the Centurion. Roman soldiers used to sleep in a group of eight, called the Contraburnium, inside a bare tent. They were supposed to rise early in the morning, and then attend a roll call in the open ground, where they were counted and then assigned duties for the day. Their duties varied from cleaning toilets, polishing armors, and patrol duty. The duties were followed by the training. The training was almost a religious affair for Caesar's legions. Not just the 10th, but the 7th, 8th, and 9th legion trained excessively every day. Breaking the formation was considered a sin-like offense, not just on the battlefield, but at the training ground too. The implications of indiscipline were severe and could be life-threatening. That is why they practiced it daily and treated the act of breaking it sacrilegious. Full-scale training maneuvers and mock skirmishes were inspected by a high-ranked officer in the legion perhaps the chief centurion or the legate himself. Julius Caesar often took it upon himself to inspect and rate soldiers. Punishment can vary on the degree of offense from a monetary fine, whipping, or even execution, but nothing was as humiliating and degrading as the decimation. For decimation, guilty soldiers were grouped in the number of 10 and were asked to draw straws. The one who picked the smallest straw was then picked and grouped with other 10th soldiers and then these misfortunate lots were beaten, stabbed, and ridiculed to death in front of the rest of the guilty party. The survivors were not pardoned either. They were treated as outcasts in the military and were forced to live outside the tents and eat the food meant for animals. They were also used as baits to lure the enemy out in the open. Decimation was such a demeaning punishment that when in 49 BC, 9th Legion tried a mutiny in retaliation of Caesar pushing them for another campaign in Greece. All Caesar had to do was to threaten the entire legion with decimation, and the 9th Legion gave in immediately. 
the hard day of training was followed by the march. The Legionnaires marched anything, from a just march of 3,000 paces, that is roughly 36 kilometers, to whatever distance they can cover in a day. And they did it while carrying 20 kilos of camping gear and construction equipment in excess of their weapon, shield, and armor. At the end of the march, Legionnaires had to raise their tents, dig up ditches, and raise barricades with wooden stakes around the camp. And then comes the guard duty at night. Legionnaires' sleeping hours were somewhere between three and five hours. On average, a 5,000-strong legion were up against a 20,000-strong tribal army during the Gallic Wars. The very first war of Caesar's army was against the migrating Helvetii, which Rome perceived as a tactic to prepare for an upcoming war against Rome. According to Caesar's notes, his four legions, which altogether were about 25,000 men, marched against 260,000 Helvetii, who also rallied with 36,000 Tulingi, 23,000 Rausi, and 32,000 Boii. For anyone keeping the count, that's 360,000 against a mere 25,000 Romans. And yet, Caesar's legions defeated this 12 times stronger army without any major issue and ended up killing more than two-thirds of the enemies. On another occasion, the 9th Legion of 5,000 soldiers conquered a hill fort of a Gallic tribe. The rest of the tribe formed an alliance and sieged the legion with a 10 times strong allied army. However, thanks to Legate Plubius' masterful strategy of using reserve cohorts as a surprise flank, which caused panic in enemy lines and soon they were all slaughtered. This victory ensured Caesar's conquest of Aquitania. Despite that, Julius Caesar's campaign on the European mainland was purely conquest-oriented. He also made his soldiers make a lot of roads and bridges wherever they went. In fact, Roman soldiers ended up doing more construction than they ever fought on these campaigns. They were the reason that all the roads led to Rome. Organized military required organized infrastructure to move on, so Roman legions built roads wherever they go, and then there were rivers, lakes, and other water bodies to cross, so they also had to build a lot of bridges. Some constructions were also for purely military purposes, such as sieges and walls to prevent the supply of rations and water inside the villages. After Caesar's civil war, when he ascended to the dictator's post, his legions took the responsibility of patrolling and guarding the streets of Rome to maintain law and order. The higher officers, such as centurions and legates, were well-versed in law as well and knew how to deal with criminal and civil cases alike. In a manner, they did every duty of modern law and order from the beat cop to district attorney. During Caesar's time, the Roman army had dissolved cavalries and legions and made the auxiliaries responsible for riding horses in the battle. However, when dealing with German King Ariovistus, Caesar was not sure about the Gallic cavalry from the Iuidi tribe used as auxiliaries. He chose to give their horses to his favorite legion, the 10th. This worked like a charm to boost the legion's morale because they treated this gesture from Caesar as providing better than what he promised them. The 10th Legion then played a part in virtually every battle of the Gallic Wars. They proved their worth first by single-handedly defeating the Helvetii tribes. After that, they saved the day in the battle against Nervians in 57 BC. As the 10th defeated two tribes at once on one side of the river, they also acknowledged the tight situation for the 12th and 7th Legions on the other side. Their rapid descent and crossing the river helped to surround the enemy from both sides and turn the tide of the battle. Caesar later picked them for the invasion of Britain as well. In his letters, Caesar always mentioned them as his most trusted unit. But this amicable relationship between Caesar and his beloved region would not end well like most love stories. Despite Caesar treating his legions well during the campaigns and promising them riches and lands, Caesar did fall short on his words twice, stoking the fire of mutiny among the ranks of his soldiers. The most well-known mutiny is the mutiny of year 47 BC, when the 10th Legion Equestris returned home to Rome, expecting the riches and land they were promised by Caesar. But then the civil war broke out, and they again led the charge against the great Pompeii at the Battle of Versailles. After 13 long years of service, the 10th Legion expected to receive their reward and discharge, but Caesar had more pressing matters as Pompey was still alive and ran off to Egypt. Caesar decided to chase him and thus got trapped in Alexandria. As the 10th Legion waited for their commander to return to Rome, the discontent grew and patience wore off. And thus, when Caesar finally arrived, he was welcomed with the news of mutiny among his favorite legion, who were sending off any authority with stones and spears who tried to reason with them. 
Caesar, unfazed by this, walked right in the middle of the legion's camp, and after listening to their demands, calmly responded, Fine, you will be rewarded for your services. Now you are dismissed, citizens. The word citizens hit the legionnaires like a brick. Until now, they wore their tag of being a soldier as a badge of honor. And with one word, Caesar tore it off them with a snap. Hysterical for losing their dignity, they all pleaded for Caesar's forgiveness and begged to take them back on his upcoming campaign. Caesar finally gave in, but made a note to who were the perpetrators of the mutiny and made sure to assign them the most vulnerable spots in the next battle. So what do you think? Do you have what it takes to be a legionnaire for Julius Caesar? Tell us in the comments and check out Nutty History for more war-related videos.